Hi, I am Molly Barnes. My guest today is Jack Steppen, a Northern California artist who has had shows at the Oakland Museum, San Francisco Museum, the Sonoma Museum. And I didn't know until today that he's also a very savvy businessman, which always helps in the art world. So without further ado, Jack. Hi. Hi, Molly. Thanks for having me here. You and I met, uh, we would go to art fairs here at the LA airport, and every year we would start talking, and we just had an affinity to you and to your art. It's uh, it's amazing. Thank you so much. How would you describe what you do, plein air painting? What does that mean? Well, plein, plein air means, uh, in the French, translates literally into the open air. And while I'm a plein air painter, I also do a lot of studio work, where I take something that I did outdoors and use it as a study for a much larger oil painting. Now, you t had a tour where you had four called the Sonoma Four, and you actually went across the country stopping at each spot to paint a painting and getting four varied, varied uh, paintings in each locale. Tell me about that. Well, uh, in 1992, we had a very uh, important show at a very prestigious San Francisco gallery, and I felt that once that show was over, that it would be kind of uh, anticlimatical and so I proposed to my colleagues that we paint our way across America. Who, who was the group? Who was well, in the group? So one of your friends, Tony King. Uh, man uh, he's an amazing artist. I bought a piece of his from Ivan Karp. Go on. Uh, Bill Morehouse, yeah. who had a, quite a career in the late 50s, early 60s. It was in the Whitney Museum. Oh, I remember him, sure. Yeah. And Bill Wheeler, who was a notorious Sonoma County resident. Kind of a hippie? Very, well, kind of the prototype of the hippie. He's hardly reconstructed. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? There are a lot of unreconstructed hippies. Yeah, yeah, but he's reconstructed. He's grown up. So what happened? How did you well, take this started, tour? Well, we started off in Yosemite and uh, painted our way across America. It was a short trip. It took three weeks. It was eight hours a day of driving, eight hours a day of painting, and eight hours a day for everything else. Now, did you plan in advance where you'd be staying we, and we, the meals we, and everything? We planned a good part of it in that we wanted to paint some of the places that the 19th century landscape painters did coming from the east to the west. For we did example, from, Bierstock? Uh, yeah, Bierstock, uh, John Moran. Uh, in fact, uh, he's the only artist I know of that has a mountain named after him. <laughs> <laughs> Moran County? No, it's, it's up in uh, the Tetons, I guess. So, so what did you do with the painting? Oh, you did one in Greenwich, Connecticut. I remember right. that. Well, we did... Uh, did you all get along on the trip? We got along pretty well. There was a little antagonism in that Tony King was anxious to make the trip short and Bill Moorehouse was anxious to make the trip long. And there, there's a li little bit of tension about that. But generally speaking, we got along. Bill did Wheeler, you go in one big van or how did you Well, we had a, a rented a big truck and Bill Moorehouse had a Suburban. So the... Four of us would take turns riding with each other and driving, and uh, we, we got along pretty darn well. I remember Henry Moore doing that. I mean, Henry Miller going across the country with an artist, and uh, the air-conditioned nightmare came out of that. Oh, wow. Well, th there were some nightmare scenes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we ate a lot of iceberg lettuce. And what, <laughs> what, why was that? Why, why? Well, it seems once you get uh, on the other side of the Sierras until you get to a big city, that the only lettuce people have is iceberg <laughs> lettuce. <laughs> so what happened to the work after it was, uh, well, the trip was uh, completed? Uh, we, we had a show at the Century Association in New York. The Century Club in New York? Yes, and the uh, Century Association is a very prestigious venue for artists. Uh, it used to be only for writers, where they right. could come and stay well, when they were Well, I'm in not York. sure. I think the Hudson River School of Painters well were members. In fact, the Century Association has one of the uh, most important collections of Hudson River School paintings. In fact, they remodeled the whole club uh, several years ago by uh, financing it by the sale of one painting. 
My friend uh, Russell Connor, who did the cover of my book, How to Get Hung, he actually does art shows there and also teaches classes on Saturdays hmm. for people that want to paint and just get together and hang out. It's amazing. Well, we, we were in good company. The, uh, Helen Frankenthaler was the show before us. And, no, yeah, no. And uh, the show after us was in memoriam of Robert Motherwell. Well, one of her husbands. <laughs> That's convenient. How did you get into becoming an artist? Did you study? Well, I started when I was a young boy. My parents th thought I showed a propensity for drawing, and they arranged for me to have drawing lessons at this little old lady's house at the edge of the woods in Yonkers, New York. And I sat, really? at, I sat at her dining room table painstakingly copying reproductions of other people's pencil drawings. Do you think that helps? Well, I think it helped, but uh, it was something that uh, was knocked out at me. Uh, my very first uh, sophisticated class of art at Columbia University School of Fine Arts when I was drawing a very realistic uh, rendering of a model and artist Pepino Mangraviti, the instructor, came and put a big X in the drawing and called me a jackass. He said, you're a human being, you have a mind, you have a soul, you have a heart. Why do you do what an inanimate object like a camera does better? <laughs> So, what liberation? Uh, not everybody reacted to that technique well. This, uh, Why? What happened? Well, I met uh, Lady uh, Barbara Novak, the, the critic, yeah, the artist historian, yeah, uh, historian of American landscape painting. She asked about my training. I told her that story, and she reached across the table and said, "Did the same thing to me. That's why I'm a historian, <laughs> not an artist." Do you so. think that can d really d destroy somebody when they get negative criticism? Well, I th I think it. Yeah, it can. It depends on the individual. I, uh, I, I think uh, negative criticism is important, though. Uh, I don't see how you can grow without what it. What was the worst that you ever got? Did you ever get a really, really scathing review? Uh, I did, but it was politically motivated, not motivated by the art. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So what happened after you got out of school? You were a businessman for a number well, of years. Well, uh, first thing that happened, I was an uh, officer in the Marine Corps for a couple of years, spent most of the time in Japan. And then I, I didn't know what I was going to be when I grew up. I had no major, I did a liberal arts degree, and somehow or other by accident I ended up in the investment banking business. and ended up helping start a few companies, and that's, uh, that's my business career. Do you feel that artists are naive about business? I, I think uh, to a certain extent they're unrealistic about it, and, but many of them are unrealistic about it because they haven't had any business experience, yeah. and somehow a lot of artists feel that uh, they make the art and somebody else ought to sell it. And, uh, that's good if somebody's willing to sell it for you, but if it's not happening, if you want to get it out there, you have to take charge of your life. I feel that often artists uh, feel victimized, that they don't really know how to court a dealer, they don't know quite what to do, so they uh, tend to sell their work too cheaply or to uh, not get out at all, not, not go to openings, not make contacts. Well, I, if you have the philosophy that it's somebody else's responsibility to get your art out there, Look at some of these. Tell, uh, we're we're go, going to go through pretty quickly, but where did this idea come from? Uh, that was painting was in Abiquiu. Here's apple blossoms in uh, Sonoma County. God, they're just beautiful. And that's uh, Sonoma uh, Coast. Actually, that painting now is in Saudi Arabia, I think. Somebody bought it from yes. uh, your guest here. Right. Go on. Uh, that's more of the, of the same Sonoma Coast scene. That's the north end of San Francisco Bay, the Baylands called. It's a Sonoma Land Trust property. And this is Bodega Head and on the Sonoma coast. Do you ever, uh, are you ever accused of being an innocent? Well, I've been accused of being a primitive, but that I think, uh, oh, this painting, by the way, is in the collection of the Cracker Art Museum in Sacramento. Is it hanging? No, they just acquired it. Oh, how perfect. <laughs> yeah. This is beautiful. Yeah, Where is this, Sacramento that, River? No, this is a Stero Americano. And what about this one? Uh, this painting is on ex uh, exhibit, I think, in the National Endowment for the Arts Office. Oh, this, this is perhaps Point Reyes. Point Reyes. Again, another coast painting. Just so, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. There's a Stero again. What does that mean? It's the Spanish word for estuary, 
an estuary is a stream that uh, is affected by the ocean where the salt water comes in. That's the Alexander Valley. Tell me about your uh, fence show, oh, that, which you're quite notorious, well known for. Well, the, when the four of us started to paint together, we would go out and paint, and we, when you finished, you packed up and went home, and we never looked at each other's work for several years, and then we decided we ought to, so we looked at our work, and it was kind of startling to see four very distinct styles rendering the same scene, and we decided that we should show the work to some art uh, professionals. We organized our first fence show, and we got the uh, invitation to some very prestigious galleries. Ended up, we showed in San Francisco's most prestigious gallery at the time. And uh, Where was that, John Berggruen? Yes, it was. Oh, good, uh, yeah. In fact, it was that show that I said, I thought it would be anticlimactical, and I suggested we paint our way across America. Well, that was amazing. Uh, John Bergeron and I had the same mentor, Frank Pearls, who was a dealer uh, from New York. He was the black sheep of the uh, Pearls clan, but he was very helpful to both of us. His uh, father had been a dealer in Europe with, uh, with John's father. father. right? Yeah, so anyway, go on. What happened? Well, well uh, for example, I just want to ask you, if you were going to do a scene, uh, how would you describe in a word the difference between your pieces? Would you say yours was naive, or would you say yours was primitive? Well, or? Well, I, I, I think it's easy to say naive or primitive because it's not recognizable as a particular style of landscape Right, right. Painting. And you don't use Renaissance perspective. I, I, I don't. And I'm, I'm not trying to be a camera. Uh, Tony King renders things very realistically. He's c c capable of photorealism if he wants to be. Bill Wheeler, on the other hand, is very emotional uh, with big gestures and... Uh, sometimes he gets a painting, and when he does, it's great. And what about Morehouse? Morehouse is kind of uh, uh, a modernist, but uh, not not a realist in the sense of like Tony is, uh, not quite as abstract as Wheeler. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to develop my own style, and I wanted to make a painting that would be difficult to ignore. Now, people may not like it, but more then likely they're going to see it if it's hanging somewhere. In fact, very frequently it'll dominate a room. So I tried to develop my own signature, my own style. So as a result of developing something that people aren't used to looking at, <laughs> it's quick to label it primitive because it's not looks doesn't look like a trained landscape. And as far as my art training, either at Columbia or at the San Francisco Art Institute, Nobody ever taught me technique. Every, the only art training I had was to be challenged to be different. That's so fantastic. Now you Here's to, more of your work before we go on. Uh, this is in Maine. Oh, oh fabulous. Was this on the trip? No, this is a subsequent trip. Now there's a the sterile keeps popping up. I like that place. Do you collect other people's work? I collect mostly ceramic sculpture. Oh, right, Bob Arneson. And there's the same kind of humor in his work yeah. that you have. Right. This painting's uh, in a collector's home here in Southern California. Who is that? Uh, I don't you can't remember. <laughs> don't remember <laughs> Who the is, name. Where is this? Uh, that, that painting is right there. It's Tony King's home. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. And that's the Walala River up in Northern California. And again, we're, this is uh, at uh, Ghost Ranch. Really? Mm -hmm. Did you ever meet George O'Keefe? No, she, she was de deceased by the time I got to Ghost Ranch. <laughs> but you painted it like George, which was her stomping ground. Yeah. Yeah, that was on your trip. What about this? This is the coast of Oregon. Have you ever tackled uh, paintings of L.A.? Oh, look uh, at no. this. This is beautiful. Uh, yeah, tentacle trees painting. That's I was in the Sonoma, and this is up in the Sierras in the snow, snow country. Who do you paint for? Who's your audience I, in I your head? I paint for myself. Really? Yeah, that's New Mexico again. There How long does a painting take? A day? A month? Uh, when I paint outdoors with acrylic, uh, most often I finish it in a day. Sometimes I have to go back a second or third day, but when I take one of these paintings I've done outdoors and enlarge it to six by eight feet, it may take me a couple months to finish it. 
Well, recently I watched you paint a painting and I saw you put it in an arbitrary uh, color and I thought, well, why does he do that? And I guess you do it to give yourself a difficult situation, but do you ever just have to throw the painting out? Uh, not often. I usually uh, keep changing it until I get something I like. And the arbitrary colors are intentional in the sense that I, I try to force an accident. To, uh, uh, maybe it's a confession of inaptitude, but the inaptitude uh, may be a key to art. I mean, if you do something perfectly every time, maybe it's craft and not art. And I, so. It, it's a way to provoke an emotional response to a situation. Well, that's what the Buddhists say, that the uh, one that has it too easy, it's not as interesting as the one that really has to struggle. Well, every painting's a struggle for me. I'm never confident that I'm going to end up with something that's worthwhile. Tell me about your relationship with the uh, cartoonist uh, Charles uh, Schultz. Oh, uh, Sparky uh, became Sparky. a friend. Yeah. yeah, that's his nickname. Sparky became a friend. Uh, I had bought a home that uh, Sparky had built and raised his family, and uh, he eventually moved off when he and his then wife were getting a divorce. So, uh, but we did we did become friendly acquaintances. What and, was he like? Oh, he's a wonderful man, very very gentle. I remember being at a gathering uh, about art, and Sparky saying, "Hmm, it's funny. Nobody thinks of me as an artist." Well, that's what I wondered. Did he feel, have hurt feelings that he wasn't taken seriously? Oh, I, I don't really think so because uh, he got such uh, international recognition. The French government gave him the Legion of Honor for being a fine artist. I think he's probably one of the most important artists of the well, I 20th know. century. And, and, and unfortunately, he didn't know that. Uh, well, he did and he didn't. I mean, Sparky was a bit of a depressive and... Uh, I think that even comes out in some of his humor. Where did he live? He lived uh, in Sonoma County. So he's very at, close to you. Uh, right. Well, he lived at the home I now have, and then he moved uh, subsequently to closer to Santa Rosa. Tell me about your home. You've, you've, uh, it's been described by other people as a mansion. Well, I don't think of it as a mansion. It's large, uh, but it, you know, it doesn't have gold faucets or... Uh, uh, marble fire uh, bathrooms or things of that nature. It's a, it's a large home. He, Sparky had five children, I think, and so there's a lot of bedrooms, small. But, Did he marry uh, again before he died? Oh, yeah, he's got a wonderful, uh, had a wonderful wife. His widow, Jean Schultz, a great lady. Uh, oh, good. Just a wonderful person. You and I have discussed um, the Tom Wolfe book, The Painted Word, which uh, 20 years ago was the definitive book on, on uh, ridiculing but also understanding contemporary art. Well, I, th I think Tom Wolfe's book is a lesson for artists in the sense that his uh, thesis was that uh, what's been recognized as great art in the United States after the end of World War II was recognized not for what the art was inherently in itself, but rather uh, what people wrote about it, and that it was the written word, the painted word, as he called it. And I think it's a lesson to artists that if if you're trying to get recognition, if you can get somebody to, to write about you, it's going to help. Look, at here's some more. Is this yeah. Mount Diablo? What was it? No, that, that was uh, Black Mountain. And here's that Black Mountain? The, well, it's called Black Mountain, and it's near Point Reyes. And this? And, and this is, uh, hmm, I forget where that <laughs> one is. <laughs> no, that was close to Maine, up in Maine, too. Uh, painting definitely is in the collection of the National Endowment of the Arts in Washington. It's in Golden Hill on Route 101 in Napa. Uh, no, Marin County, and a place called Scotty Gulch. Uh, that painting's in San Diego, and that's another painting that's in Saudi Arabia. So it been, also looks like Milton Avery over on the, <laughs> on the right side. Yeah. So, what about this? This is uh, also his stereo, and, yeah. and we're, seeing, we're seeing some of these images a second time. That painting's called Joy. And there's uh, Mount St. Helena again. Do you find a difference in the color between uh, Southern and Northern California? Than reacting to something emotionally and saying, hey, I really like this. They want to know that somebody else likes it. You've had a wonderful dealer here for a number of years. I, actually, he was the uh, first art person I ever worked for, Herb Palmer. Oh, uh, terrific. Is he a great dealer? Does 
Her Herbert is, you know, the history of Herbert, uh, you know better than I do here, living here in Los Angeles, but he was, I guess, for many years, one of the most important dealers in L.A. Well, he very briefly was with, um, oh, what's his name from New York, I, whose name I've just forgotten, uh, Herb Palmer and, um, oh, I can't think of his name. <laughs> But uh, they had a John Cage concert that I put on when I was there, Four wow. Minutes of Silence. And uh, there was, you know, they, they introduced John Cage, and then there was nothing, just nothing. And then we heard a carrot juice going down his esophagus. <laughs> and the thing that did... Well, I find, yeah, in fact, whenever you change geographic locations, uh, you have to adapt your palate and, your, and maybe even your style. Uh, you, you develop uh, a, a vocabulary, so to speak, when you paint in the same place over and over again. And if you go somewhere else, that vocabulary doesn't necessarily work. Kind of a mixed metaphor there, but it works. Did you find that traveling across the country? <laughs> oh, yes. It's, it's far more difficult to get to a new scene that you've never seen before and invent how you're going to handle it. Donald Cuspit spoke very glowingly about your work. How, would, how did he describe it? Well, death he, and rebirth, he talked well, about. Well, he talked about death and rebirth, uh, particularly with the blossom paintings that is symbolic of birth and uh, death. And he spoke about uh, nature having uh, an unrelenting uh, process of change. And he felt that my paintings captured that. That no that matter what happens, nature just keeps... Nature, nature's going to uh, do whatever it wants. It's going to keep changing. What else did he feel about your work? I don't know. He called my Farallon Island paintings glorious. That's a, yeah, that's, that's exactly a, how I feel. A, that's quite and a back compliment. to the Tom Wolfe idea of, uh, of, of writing being more important. Jasper Johns commented on that when he said the critic sees, and it was a pair of glasses with a mouth, you know, rather than <laughs> eyes. Yeah. Well, frequently uh, people have written about art when they were really writing about their own philosophical <laughs> meanderings <laughs> and not course. about the art. Uh, so I, 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 I think uh, Tom Wolfe overdid it. There was a lot of great art produced in this country after World War II, and it wasn't only recognized because of what people wrote about it. Uh, but, uh, but I think it's a hint to artists that if uh, getting yourself, your art reproduced or written about helps in getting it out there. I was trying to sell a piece of art the other day, and um, the, the man was reluctant to buy. And I said, wait, there's a book on this artist. And I ran in and got it. And of course, he bought it. I mean, it, it, it is people are afraid to take chances on buying. They don't they, want to look they, foolish. Well, they don't have confidence that their judgment is right. For me, and this was in the late 60s, was it really opened up the idea of not only chance music, where nothing is written down, but also the idea that silence is as important as... The, mm -hmm. the music itself, which we've learned in, uh, in color field paintings, you know, where there is, a, a, like a Ken Nolan, if there's white between the two colors, it makes them jump out rather mm -hmm. than just blend in the way Helen Frankenthaler did. Well, the, the brain interprets its experience in many different ways, uh, and uh, colors playing against each other have an emotional response, but also in my paintings, there are lots of bits and pieces of colors that wouldn't necessarily be associated with the landscape. And people look at my paintings and they don't see those colors because they only see the landscape in the, in the image. But those little bits of color scattered throughout the painting are vibrating in the brain and the visual cortex because the visual cortex sees more than the conscious brain processes. Do you so, think artists have different, different uh, brains or do just train differently? Well, we're probably more more lunatic than most people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always... But you mentioned the music. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, if somebody plays every note perfectly, it's boring. It's the interval between the notes where the artistry comes out. Who are your favorite artists? Oh, I don't know. If I've you had to name one or two. I like the German Expressionists. So do you I really? Do. Yes, I, I do. Uh, but, I, you know, I've studied the whole pantheon of Western art and quite a bit of art in Japan. Well, you I, paint like a Westerner in that you, you build up from the, uh, from the back rather than a, an Oriental artist, which would start in the front and move back. Uh, yeah, but I, I think maybe some sense of composition came out of uh, looking at Oriental art. Uh, 
I think that's probably the biggest thing that I got out of my years in Japan. Um, I really don't have any one favorite. Uh, I just like them all. Do you like any of the abstract expressionists? Oh, yeah, Clifford Still and that whole school. And what about Milton Avery? Your work yeah, reminds me yeah, of Yeah, I like Milton's work very much, yeah. When my husband said, saw your work, he said that you, you were a designer. It, you're not, but do you, do you feel that you set up your, um, uh, uh, with sketches, what you're going to be painting in a I, 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 just, I paint right on the canvas. I don't sketch first. I, if anything, I may do a rough cartoon first, but... Uh, it's all serendipity. I never know what the painting's going to look like when Jack, I Jack, what's, what's next? What's next? More art. Do you just keep going. You'd, just keep going. It's funny how, as artists, we, get, uh, we never get too old. I mean, we just keep going. And I, uh, That reminds me of a music story. Uh, 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 it was in Bergruen's gallery. And he was having a show of very important New York artist, Ellsworth Kelly. And Ellsworth Kelly asked what kind of art I did. And I said, I painted en plein air. <laughs> and he said, oh, that's what I want to do. <laughs> How <laughs> I, perfect. Uh, so. <laughs> that's perfect. Jack, I cannot thank you enough for coming today. I know you flew down from San Francisco for several reasons, and I feel honored that I got a little of your time. Well, I'm very flattered to be here with you, Molly. Thank you. Thank you. Art is not for everyone. It never has been. It never will be. But for those of you who love it like we do, we want to turn you on. I'm Molly Barnes. Thanks for watching.